was abandoned. A lot of the, the buildings, quite frankly, don't function anymore for good retail. You don't even have housing above it. And the community said, this is our vision for what we want to see in our community. You also had another community, Madisonville, who also had a similar vision. Walnut Hills, another neighborhood which is much closer into downtown Cincinnati, they spent 30 years fighting to get their main uh, commercial corridor changed back to a two-way street, and this was the celebration of it. This is what the street currently looks like, and this is what they want the street to look like. Now, um, the interesting thing about it is that just because you have a vision and a dream doesn't mean anything happens with it, right? It's like, it's like, you know, I've had lots of visions and dreams and nothing's happened with it because I don't have the horsepower in the terms of what's in my wallet to make it happen. Um, and so you have to put money behind it and you have to have people who know what they're doing to execute. We learned that at the banks. We learned that in Over the Rhine. And we now know, apply those lessons to our neighborhoods. And so in Walnut Hills, they actually are in control of two major corners uh, of their commercial corridor. They have partnered with a private developer to, through their Community Redevelopment Corporation to redevelop a critical piece of um, the corridor into apartments as well as retail. And now they're negotiating with developers who are literally knocking at their door who want to redevelop the property that that neighborhood has under control. And that's another key piece, neighborhoods controlling the property so that they can actually negotiate with developers. College Hill, the same thing. The city has invested um, significant dollars, more than even what's here, in helping that community acquire property to do the site assembly that's necessary to get developers to pay attention They've put out an RFP requesting developers to respond, and developers are. They're coming in and responding to the proposals that have been requested. And the city, for its part, understands that these neighborhoods, in order to be successful, have to be helped to understand that there is a whole toolbox of financing options that need to be put together because everything costs a lot of money, right? It's like everything costs a lot of money and CDBG grants don't go in far enough to get you where you need to go. And so neighborhoods learning how to aggressively use historic tax credits, to aggressively use new market tax credits. The city of Cincinnati actually figuring out with a lot of brain damage how to issue bonds so that you could bond development in neighborhoods. That was probably the most significant thing that was necessary because it was the first time we could bring real money to the table and encouraging community development corporations to form partnerships with private developers. It was essential. And so, you know, we're not done, obviously. It's just, again, beginning because this, as, as many of my colleagues in many of the neighborhoods now say, you know, I thought when I was younger that we would get this done in 10 years. And now, 30 years later, we're just beginning to see, and so for some people it's been 40 years later, we're just beginning to see. But when they say that, it just reinforces in my mind, again, you have to have people who are keepers of the vision. You have to have a plan and understand the strategy behind implementing that plan and also be opportunistic. You have to have leadership that understands collaboration and understands that when it comes to development and particularly in communities, that the community has to be singing off the same page and have to, has to actually have a vision that is shared and then you also have to have the capacity, the people, the resources to execute on the plan so that you can actually achieve the vision. Um, those are some of the lessons I learned, and I think that's what the city of Cincinnati has learned. We're in a very exciting time. Um, it's always good to see good headlines, but we know that um, there's a lot of work that we still have to do. Um, but for the first time in many years, people actually believe that it can be done. Thank you very much. Roxanne, thank you so much. I'd like to welcome the other panelists for our discussion now to the stage. First, the Honorable Dane Walling. 
He is serving his second term as the mayor of the city of Flint. His vision of a sustainable 21st century community has attracted new investments and energy to the difficult challenge of turning Flint around. He's working on bringing new jobs, making neighborhoods safe, and supporting great schools in Flint and across Michigan. And under his leadership, the city of Flint has adopted its first comprehensive master plan in more than 50 years. Next, we have Khalil Ligon. She grew up in Detroit and is committed to advancing communities through planning, engagement, advocacy, and action. She is a graduate of DPS and holds a bachelor's degree from Kalamazoo College and a master's degree in urban planning from Wayne State. She has developed award-winning city planning projects throughout Michigan, including the city of Jackson's West End District and Detroit's Lower East Side Action Plan, or LEAP, which is an acclaimed grassroots community planning project. And through her leadership, LEAP received the EPA National Award for Smart Growth Achievement. She also serves as the Southeast Michigan Outreach Coordinator for the Alliance of the Great Lakes. Finally, Gary Brown grew up in Detroit and is a graduate of Detroit's Northwestern High School. He holds a Bachelor in Criminal, Criminal Justice from Wayne State and a Master's of Science degree from EMU. He also attended the FBI National Academy as well as Northwestern University Staff and Command. He served in the Detroit Police Department for 26 years as a patrol officer and retired as the Deputy Police Chief. In 2009, he was elected as the Detroit City Council President Pro Tem, and in 2013, he was appointed to the non elected position of chief compliance officer under the state appointed emergency manager and following the election of mayor mike duggan he was appointed as the chief operations officer a position he currently serves so thank you all for being here this evening <laughs> roxanne i want to actually come to you first because i think the question we have to answer first is what do we stand to lose if we don't have a plan in place that we can follow through on, engage the community in, what do we stand to lose? I think, I think that um, it's very clear what we stand to lose. And for some of the communities in the city of Cincinnati, I, see, I saw it and I continue to see it every day what they lose and that is that they just become more deserted, more abandoned, more blighted. Um, and while people complain and everybody wishes it were different, nothing happens. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, I can't emphasize how much, it's not just the plan. I mean, the plan's important, but you have to have the leadership of the community because, you know, we all have been in communities and we know that everybody considers themselves a leader, right? Um, and, and they are. Um, so it's important for those people who identify themselves as leaders, whether they're self-identified or they really are heading up organizations, that they have to learn how to play together. Mm -hmm. You know, and they have to learn, and this has been probably the most significant lesson for the neighborhoods that really are beginning to show traction in Cincinnati. The leadership, um, they may disagree with one another, but they never allow it to become public. I mean, they're very disciplined. And that whenever they are presenting to the political community, everybody says the exact same thing. They have one message and they stick to it. And they can go back and they can fight and they can do whatever they want, but they do not present that to the, to the political community because that's like death. Mm -hmm. um, and so what you have to lose is things stay the same or become worse. Mm -hmm. Uh, just a quick couple of notes. You see people in the alleyway holding cards. If you have questions, just raise your hand. They'll bring you a card, and, and we'll make sure we get to as many questions as we can at the end of the discussion. And also, if you're tweeting this event, use the hashtag DFCIdeas. Um, Mayor Walling, I'd like to come to you next. We know Flint recently went through a visioning and planning process, and it was a process. You engage the council, planning commission, and community members to create this shared vision of what happens for Flint in the future. Why was that important for you? Well, thank you for the question. I also just first want to say it's a pleasure to be a part of this discussion here. Of course, we follow uh, what's happening in Detroit very closely, and so it's an honor to be involved in the, in the discussion here. I, I'm a mayor of Flint, but I'm still a booster for Detroit. Uh, Michigan has to have uh, a Detroit that, that works and, and is prosperous um, with the equitable region. So that, that's something that we're not in your media market, but we, we talk about that too. Um, and 
Um, I mean, in terms of the, the Flint experience and the value of a vision, I think, I think um, Mayor Qualls articulated it very well. You know, we had been on the losing end of a lot of trends and a lot of issues in Flint for a long time. So it was imperative, as I saw it, that we finally get the community truly onto one page. You know, and we say that a lot, but we, we really had to get on one page. And uh, for us, uh, that meant getting our, our business and, and community leaders together um, in a structured process that involved our planning commission, which ultimately had to adopt the master plan, and, and city council, which would have to approve it after that, and that they had to be at the table early. So we, we actually took about six months to hammer out that memorandum of understanding that laid out uh, my role and the administration's role, what the council would do, what the planning commission would do, how that mapped onto our charter, how it mapped onto state law, the, the federal grant for sustainable communities we received from one of the president's initiatives. And, and then we could actually go out and engage the public in, in a process of defining a vision uh, based first around principles and values that was important for our community to talk about sustainability and equi equity and what those things mean. Uh, we found it was actually pretty simple. Uh, a lot of us in this room probably debate some of those things. Our community said uh, social equity is everyone feels safe everywhere. Very simple, hard to reach that goal, but a very simple standard to meet. We're, we're still working on that in Flint, but that's, that's what our community laid out. Uh, and then we also realized that the plan had to be action oriented, that we didn't want to meet just to meet. We wanted to define uh, an action plan. We wanted to solve problems. So you'll see in our adopted master plan, imagineflint.com, that every chapter ends with a series of spreadsheets. And it lays out strategies and partners and metrics and uh, whether something is short term, medium, or long term, and whether it's kind of like a restaurant, $1 sign, $2 signs, or $3 signs. And we use that to help us make decisions about our, our, our public resources. So it really, um, it took a few years, but we got everybody on the same page. We committed to an action plan, and, and now we have this foundation that we can actually move, move forward from. Mm -hmm. Khalil, I think the experience of developing this kind of strategic plan for a city is very different depending upon which side of the table you're sitting on. So from the resident side of the table, the community perspective, what is that experience like? What works well and what doesn't work? Well, I think the advantage of having a table where folks who often feel like they are disconnected from those processes or excluded from those decisions that are happening about their particular community. The importance is having a place like these two have talked about where you can come to that table and express those those frustrations, express those ideas. You have to be able to, to deal with both of those because you're talking about these places where we've lived in such a state for so long, it sometimes does breed hopelessness. So a, a community process has two purposes. One is to get a plan so that we know what we want to do and where to go forward, but also start to re replant those seeds of hope that it's possible. And that me as just, you know, an average resident here in the city of Detroit, that what I think and what I need does matter to the folks who are at the decision-making table, those who have control of the, the resources that make these things happen. So I think it's important to make sure that when we are um, thinking about the future of our city, that it is about everybody. I know that that seems like a lofty goal, but I mean, if we are serious about creating a Detroit of the future, then it has to be a very inclusive conversation, no matter how difficult that might be. I mean, we didn't get to this situation overnight, and it won't change overnight. So we have to start to restore credibility in our government. We have to start to restore faith in each other and restore that familial and social connection that we need to care about our neighbors so that we don't, you know, victimize each other in our own neighborhoods, that we don't throw pop bottles out on the street. We have a role and responsibility to do a citizen's as well. So it doesn't just rest on one side of the table. It's not just on the residents to take the tax hikes and to deal with the potholes and deal with the street lights being out. And it is not also just on the government to, to make sure that those things are corrected. So we have to have a place where we can have a dialogue with all the people, with, with the residents, with the businesses, with the